um, righteous Titus on Sunday. Covered in going all the way. And here we are in Titus chapter 2 out of 3. And here we're in 1 Peter chapter 3. And lo and behold, the Lord must want us to get this. It's the same subject <laughs> as it was last Sunday. So Paul is writing to Titus about this, and 1 Peter is writing to believers under his sphere of influence about this same thing. And we um, talk... Yeah, Sunday morning about submission because in today's world the idea of a wife being submitted to her husband seems not all, only alien or alien to um, uh, Americans today but it it seems improper it seems um, shameful you should never expect a woman to submit to someone could be the man and uh, the Bible never teaches that a woman to submit to someone because he's a man. It teaches she should submit to someone because he's her husband. Yeah. Doesn't submit to all men. But I'll guarantee you every wife out there that is offended by the idea of submittance submits to men all over the place. If their boss is a man, she submits to that man. If she's in the military, and her corporal and her sergeant are men, she submits to those men. If the lieutenant's a man, she submits to that man. So it's just part of life. Every one of us submit to a ton of people. Oh, yeah. I have a boss. Somebody's gone this week, so he's assigned me two extra rooms all week. I don't get to argue with him. He's my boss. Somebody's got to make up the work. So he gave everybody a little share of this other guy's work. And I got a share of two rooms. Mm -hmm. I submit to him without thinking for one moment that's, that it's demeaning, or without thinking for one moment that makes him better than me. No, no it doesn't. It simply means he has a different position yeah, different. at the place I work than I do. He's kind of like a foreman. That's not his official title, but he runs the janitorial staff. So he's kind of like our foreman. Uh, and so that's his job description. And so I got to do what he says if I want to keep my job. Amen. It's not demeaning. We understand that. We submit everywhere. I'm not sure. Everybody, everybody yeah. submit. That's why Daryl drove trucks, so he had no one to submit to. <laughs> just he could just get behind the wheel and go. But we working people outside of uh, self-employed truck drivers, we got people telling us, do this, do this, do this. And if that's not bad enough, we got politicians saying, do this, do this, do this. We've got cops. I'm going to tell you something. Cop pull me over. I'm submitting. I'm going to submit to that cop, whether it's a male or a female. That person pulls me over wearing that blue outfit, one of the city's finest. I'm going to do what I'm told. Make sense? It doesn't make that person better than me. It simply no, makes sure. that person have a different position. And if that person pulls me over, she has authority over me at that moment. When I'm driving through a busy intersection and the lights no, matter, uh, no longer matter because there's an officer doing this, I'm going to submit to that guy for two reasons. I'm going to get in a car accident if I don't. And number two... I've seen it. I've seen guys miss it and they start pulling through and I've seen those officers stop everybody and walk up to that window and give them an earful. Mm. That guy's got the entire weight of the law behind him. He's no better than I am. But he has authority in that situation. I must submit to his authority. So this idea that it's offensive for anybody to submit to anybody is crazy. Every one of us submit to all kinds of people every one of us and uh, so that's just the way life works and uh, I mentioned Sunday when we were talking about this every organization must have a head so that they can break the deadlock because if different people in that organization want different things somebody has to have the final say and in the organization of marriage 
if the husband wants to move to California, oh no, that one, no, no smart husband would do that. If the husband <laughs> wants to move to Florida, and the wife wants to move to Texas, there's a deadlock. Somebody has to have the final say, or the marriage breaks up. The wife goes to Texas, the husband goes to Florida. And so, there is authority everywhere, but we shared some things Sunday that we'll get into again, why the, the uh, doctrine of submission ought not to offend anyone. And we'll go over them again tonight some. So, Father, thank you for the word in First Peter, what it bless our such pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, last week, we talked about a righteous and healed people. And we talked about um, uh, how Jesus uh, suffered for us. He never sinned. He never deceived anyone. When he was reviled, he didn't revile back. And... Uh, and we talked last week about that being a unique situation. Jesus was stuck in the position he was in. No option. He was going to die. The people who arrested him had no authority over him. He told Peter, I could call 12 legions of angels. He wasn't stuck in that position because of the people who arrested him. He was stuck there because it was the divine will of God Almighty that he died for our sins. He had no out. And because he had no out, he suffered for us. Now that's key because he, before the week before he was telling servants, and that word in the Greek could mean either slaves or hired help. Now, none of us are slaves, but most of us have been hired help from time to time. So, if First Peter had slaves the way we think of slaves in America in mind, then the word master would mean just that. Somebody who owns you. And when he told you to do something, Peter said, do it. If it meant hired help, then he's saying, in essence, if your boss tells you to do something, do it. Even if that slave owner or that boss is a mean-spirited, horrible person, the slave owner has no out. The boss can kill him if he doesn't do what he's told. The employee, if he needs a paycheck, doesn't have an out at that moment. You need to go out and find another job before the, you tell the boss off. Yeah. And so, after talking about that, he said Jesus was our example on this. There was a time when Jesus had no out. He was not going to get out of what he was in. And because of that, he kept his mouth shut. Is that always who Jesus is? I tell you what, the next time some of those folks see him, Jesus will be sitting on the throne and they will not revile him. He'll be a man of authority at that time. So this passage isn't telling us that we should always do what we're told and never question anybody. But it's talking about specifically you're either an owned person, a slave, or you're an employed person that's got to get a paycheck. And so you have no out. So follow the example of Jesus when the boss is mean to you. And I'll talk about the employee part because none of us ever live the other part. When the boss is mean to you, put up with it until you can find another job. When, if you don't like the boss, every time you have a little time, spare time, go look for another one. And put up with the boss until you have an out. Mm -hmm. Jesus put up with something until that situation changed. He was our example. Pray for him. Pardon me? I said, pray for him. Yes. Yeah, dude. And pray we have them. Sometimes the bosses need a lot of prayers. And then he went on with verse 24 uh, last week to talk about how uh, we being dead to sin should live on to righteousness because Jesus bore our own sins in his body and by whose stripes we're healed. And so we concluded last week um, by talking about the fact that I believe not every preacher, most preachers would disagree with me. I'm going to be up front with you. Uh, I believe that the death on the cross and the suffering leading up to it in Pilate's judgment hall 
that redemption included both physical and spiritual things. And so I believe Jesus died to save me from my sins, the spiritual side, and to heal me from my sicknesses, the, the physical. Mm -hmm. And people say, if that's the case, why does anybody get sick? And my question is, well, it said he saved me so I could live righteously. If that's the truth, then it must be because it's written in the Word of God. How come I don't live perfectly? So to say that he doesn't want to heal me because I'm sick sometimes is to say that he doesn't want me to live righteously because I sin sometimes. Doesn't make sense. So how are they connected? I will live righteously and healthy to the direct proportion I believe what Jesus said about me. This is a walk of faith. And none of us will be perfect in our faith in this life. So, and our desire to live absolutely righteously in the presence of God will fail sometimes. And our desire to take advantage of the fact that He bore our sicknesses, our faith will waver and we'll have a sickness take hold of us. But it doesn't change the promise in either case. So we talked about that. Now this week, we move on from chapter 2 to chapter 3, and I'm sticking to a something people for, I don't know, about the 10th week in a row. This time we're going to talk about a beautiful people. Look up here, folks, we're talking about a beautiful people. <laughs> All right. So, uh, not, not what we're talking about today. Uh, he would desire you and I be beautiful, but he's going to talk about the wives. Likewise, so after talking about servants, which could either be slaves or hired people, okay? After talking about that, the last chapter, he now goes to another area of subjection. And he says, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Not every guy out there. To your own husband. Right. That if any obey not the word, if any of your if any of you women, if you have a husband that doesn't obey the scripture, he's not a Christian. If any, the reason he's wanting you to be subject to him because if he's not saved, if he's not obeying the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation or the lifestyle of the woman. So he's saying if you're a Christian woman married to a sinner man. You preaching to them not going to get it done. Your best opportunity is to be is to be an example of a Christian wife. And an uh, unsaved man might take advantage of that. There's a risk factor. But if your ultimate goal is to see that man saved, then this is a key element to that. Exemplify the Christian conduct of a Christian wife. And he'll see, even on his ordinary days, this woman being submissive, not beaten down, not doing this stuff, just trying to cooperate with her husband if he tells her to do something that's not illegal. She tries to do it. She's walking out a testimony. So this is the different reason here than what we've been talking about. Dealing with a woman married to an unsaved person. My question would always be, why would you marry an unsaved person? Jesus said, what fellowship has light with darkness? Right. If you were a Christian, you should have found a Christian husband. Uh, but sometimes a woman gets saved after they're married. Mm -hmm. Neither one was uh, saved at the time of the marriage. And she's saved and all in, and she's in church, and he won't go, and he's ornery. Peter said, this will help be a testimony to your husband. Be submissive to your husband. So this is more than being more submissive because the scripture teaches that. He's giving a different reason right here. This is to give God an avenue to speak to your husband through the testimony of your life. That's what he's talking about here. All right? Now, so it said, excuse me just a second. I'm thinking I'm wanting to sneeze. <coughs> Thank Bless you, you, Father, for divine health. All right, now, so it said, let me read verse 1 again and add verse 2 because it's the completion of the sentence. Wives be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, any of the husband, the, the husband you might have, they also may without the word be won by the conversation. That doesn't mean you're talking. That means the way you live. 
the conversation of the wives, verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation, again, that's talking, the Greek word rendered con uh, conversation in the Greek is not talking about talking, it's talking about how you live, okay, lifestyle. While they behold your chaste lifestyle coupled with fear. All right, now let's put this over. Uh, the New American Standard puts that last verse as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. So what can happen when we yieldingly do what the scriptures teach us? Christian wives can see their non-Christian husbands come to know Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. If you know any Christian wives that, whose husbands aren't saved, show them this area and say, I'm not preaching at you. I'm telling you, do this and stand on it. Consider it a promise from God. Act the way God wants you to act as a testimony to your unsaved husband and say, God, you said this. I am putting my faith right there. Lord. But instead, if you bicker with them all the time, you're on your own. You're going to have to find another way to win them. Yeah. I'd rather get God cooperating with me. How about you? All right. Now, he goes on to talk about women being married. And he said... Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, of wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel. The translation called God's Word renders that verse this way. Wives must not let their beauty be something external. Beauty doesn't come from hairstyles, gold jewelry, or clothes. Verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. Now what's this all about? I'll tell you what this is all about. This is the Holy Spirit talking. He's inspiring Peter to write this. The Holy Spirit doesn't care how beautiful someone is. The Holy Spirit doesn't like the drop-dead gorgeous woman better than the uh, homely woman. And can I tell you a mystery? Many of those homely women in the eyes of God are far more beautiful than the ones the guys are whistling at. God has a different idea about beauty than we do. So we think, I'm going to fix myself up just right. My husband better treat me right because all those guys are going to whistle at me. They're ugly. I bet I God, it. We go out to eat anywhere and guys whistle on my wife. I get so tired. I bet God thinks <laughs> art's beautiful. Yeah. But the point is, what Peter's telling is you need to understand this. And me. And genuine beauty is external. The thing that God considers beautiful. How many of you think God's viewpoint is the most important one of all? Amen. God's viewpoint on beautiful and our viewpoint, viewpoint on beautiful are two different things. God, or my viewpoint on beautiful, when we look at people, the beautiful people out there, mm. is skin deep. Mm. Some of them are some of the meanest, uh, self-centered people on the planet. Not all of them. They're good-looking people who are really nice. Mm -hmm. But many of them think they're all that, everything but easy for them because jobs like to hire the pretty women and the handsome guys. And I tell you today, you can't even read the news on a news web network unless you're a good-looking guy or a pretty woman. Mm -hmm. yeah. Doesn't matter how talented you are, they'll throw a few uh, homely guys out there, but not many. Most of them are good-looking, and just mm -hmm. about every woman can't do the weather can't do the news, can't do the sports, unless they're good looking externally. So they have it easier than the rest of us. The rest of us have to work to, to get a break. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not their fault they're pretty. It's not their fault they're handsome. There's nothing wrong with that. They were gifted for whatever reason. But God said, I don't look at beauty the way you look at beauty. God sees something beautiful in my wife I might miss sometimes. She's beautiful. The fact that she's head over heels in love with Jesus. That's beauty to God. Mm -hmm. That's beauty to God. Yeah. That's beauty. In her relationship with God, she doesn't have to worry about getting older. She doesn't have to worry if she puts on a hundred pounds. <laughs> She's not going to do that. She doesn't have to worry she likes her petite about any external thing whatever because it isn't what God 
is looking at. Let's look on here. So let me reread verse 3 and then go to verse 4. Who's adorning this Christian wife? Who's adorning? Let it not be a, the, that outward adorning of plaiting the hair or wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. Now listen. God is not saying you shouldn't plait your hair or wear gold jewelry. Because that same verse says, or putting on of apparel. I think God wants women to put clothes on before they go out. <laughs> yeah. So if I'm going to read that verse yeah. and say, God doesn't want you to plait the hair, then he doesn't want you to wear apparel. Now that's just stupid. That's not what Peter is getting at. He's saying, don't let this be the main thing you consider important. So he said, but, verse 4, let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible. The nature of God in you is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God, of great price. So again, Gusick says what I just said. Peter does not forbid a woman fixing her hair or wearing jewelry any more than he forbids her wearing uh, apparel. But then he goes on to say, the incorruption, uh, incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, uh, he comments on that, the inner beauty of a godly woman is incorruptible. This means that it does not decay or get worse with age. Instead, incorruptible beauty only gets better with age, and it's of so much more value uh, than the beauty that comes from the hair jewelry or the clothing. So what is true beauty? Uh, Peter describes the character of true beauty as a gentle and quiet spirit. These character traits are not promised for women by our culture, but they are very, are not promoted for women by our culture, but they are very precious in the sight of God. Now, if you want to be beautiful to God, develop a gentle and quiet spirit. Now listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come on to me. This is Jesus talking to you. Come on to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Listen to what he said. For I am meek and lowly in heart. What's the woman to be? meek and a quiet spirit. Jesus and I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's amazing to me, Jesus said, come here, I want to teach you something. You're tired, life is beating you up, come here, I want to teach you something. So we go running, thinking he's going to teach us how to heal the sick, how to raise the dead, to do miracles. But he said, no, no, here's what I want you to learn from me. I am meek and lowly. He said, if you get this stuff, you'll find rest for your soul. No matter what they did to Jesus, they couldn't take anything away from him. He gave it all away when he left heaven. He left all the glory of heaven behind. They had nothing to take from him. They just helped him get back there. It's an amazing life when you don't fear someone's going to take it away from you. When you walk around scared to death, somebody's going to steal it from you. Again, you know, you heard me talk about the ridiculous thing that there are people in church that'll go home if some visitor comes and sits in their seat. Like they can't listen to the sermon or sing a hymn, a row back or a row forward. It's the most ridiculous thing in the world. So when it said that Jesus was equal to God, in Philippians chapter 2, in the Greek it's actually saying he didn't think equality with God was something to be grasped or held on to. Yeah. The reason Jesus came and saved us, even though he had equality with the Father, by the way, he was subject to the Father, but equal to the Father. Who's in charge and who's in submission has nothing to do with equality. People say women are equal. Yes, they are in every way, shape, and form. Absolutely. Got nothing to do with the subject. Nothing. Jesus is subject to God, the Father, but equal to. 
And so, to come and save us, he had to leave some of that equality behind. So he thought that equality of God, with God, it wasn't something for him to hold on to, like people want to hold on to their pew. It's the dumbest thing I have ever heard about in my life. It's a chair! Right. Somebody comes to your house and visits you and sits down in your favorite chair, so what? <laughs> Jesus didn't cling to heaven for you and you're going to cling to a chair? Turn around and tell somebody, you might have a point. <laughs> All right? So, Jesus said, here's what I want you to learn. This is what makes life easier. This is what gives you a restful spirit. Meekness and lowness. Don't fight for everything. He's not telling you you can't be ambitious, want a better job. But he's saying don't make that the secret to your happiness. And if somebody comes at work and gets behind your back and steals your promotion, Jesus said, oh wow. Yeah. Don't let that define your happiness. If you want rest for your soul, it isn't about me teaching you how to do miracles. It's about you learning from my example, meekness and lowliness. Now I put that there because Peter writes to his readers that what a woman ought to adorn herself with, listen to it again, a meek and quiet spirit. Isn't it amazing what God finds precious in a woman, not just a woman, but he's talking to the women here, but it's not just what he finds precious in a woman. What he finds, but for the subject right now, what he finds special in a woman is a meek and quiet spirit. What did Jesus say, I want you to learn from me? I am meek and lowly in heart. Isn't that amazing? Jesus said, I'm meek. He said, women be meek. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I'm lowly in heart. Women have a quiet spirit. Yeah, he's in essence telling, Peter's in essence writing to the woman. And in retrospect, he's writing to all of us because Jesus is an example to us all. And this is what makes you beautiful. And this is what makes you beautiful to God might not make you beautiful to your neighbor. There'll be days it does. They'll say, what a nice person. But there might be other days, you know, some people can't be satisfied. You might get around a nasty neighbor, it doesn't, neighbor, doesn't matter how nice you are or anything. They might not like you for anything. But you know what? When we do it His way, God's always going to like us. God finds us something of great price. So when I entitled the lesson, A Beautiful People, this is speaking the lesson, especially to women, because he's addressing the woman's submission right now to win her unsaved husband. But the truth is, that's why I brought uh, Matthew in to show you it applies to all of us. Jesus said to men and women, come here, learn this. This will keep you calm in the storm. This will keep you... Why was Jesus sleeping when the boat was about to go down and all of his disciples were fearing for their lives? Because he had peace in his soul. Rest in his soul. Why? He was meek and mild. The world couldn't take anything from him. Couldn't take a thing from him. Because he wasn't possessive of anything the world gives you. He left everything heaven gave him for crying out loud. What's the world going to give him? And because he left all that behind, they had nothing to take from him. All the precious stuff he willingly walked away from in heaven. It blows my mind when I think, I think it out in detail. He left the throne of heaven. Almighty God, 
Jesus the Son who fills the universe left the splendor of heaven and entered the womb of a woman as a small cell as it grew for nine months. Process that. He didn't step out of heaven come down here at 30 years old. He went through the whole process like yeah. you did. Except when you showed up, conceived in the womb, you didn't know what was going on. He willingly stepped away from that throne and entered this world the way you entered it. Wow, isn't that something? Yeah. He's that all there. for us. Can you imagine what an honor that would have been to to be chosen to be the mother of the Savior of the world. Well, and I'm sure she didn't understand all, well, yes she did, because the angel told her all that. Uh, she was the only woman, she was a unique woman, not because of anything she did, she was a unique woman because of how God chose her. She was a virgin uh, too. To be, I mean, uh, that was a once in a world time, that'll never happen again. Uh, only Jesus is only going to be born into this world one time and Mary had the honor. Mm -hmm. So now verse 5. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. All right. So, we're going to examine that. Abraham was called Lord by Sarah. Not really. He <laughs> said right there. Yeah, let's read the whole story. Sarah never actually called, to our knowledge, Abraham Lord. You know where that came from in the Old Testament that Peter's alluding to? The two, the three angels come to visit with Abraham. Two of them go on down to Sodom. One stays behind. And that one that stays behind, some believe it's the pre-incarnate Christ. I, I think it's just an angel. But nonetheless, whoever it was, the words coming out of its mouth were God's words. Because angels are messengers of God. When they speak to you, they're speaking God's word. So it doesn't matter if it was God or the angel. It's the word of God. And this angel stays behind and tells Abraham that after 24 years of waiting for the promised child, he's 99, she's 89. I've never necessarily seen an 89-year-old woman who was drop-dead gorgeous. Having said that, in 20 years, I'll have to change that. <laughs> But my point is, this angel said, this time next year, that promised child is going to be born. Sarah, in the tent prepare, preparing some food, hears that angel and doubts God. And she said, yeah, like my master's going to get younger and uh, not, she didn't say my master, she said, yeah, like my Lord's going to get younger. She thought in her head how ridiculous the thing the angel said was. And in her thoughts, she referred to Abraham as Lord. So in her silence of her mind, she referred to Abraham as Lord. I doubt she ever gave Abraham the pleasure of hearing those words come out of her mouth. But the angel heard them because he heard her thoughts. Now, she was subject. Or, let's read about that. Genesis 21, verses 9 to 12. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham. She saw that boy mocking. He was 13 years older than Isaac. And they were throwing a party the day, um, or the day they called like a bar mitzvah. Um, they recognized he had come of age, and they were throwing him a party, 
And evidently he looked mockingly at the little boy, Isaac. Or at least that's the way Sarah took it. And when a woman takes something a certain way, ain't no talking her out of it. So here's what Sarah said. This is how constantly submissive she was to Abraham. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out that blonde woman with her son. She ain't asking. She ain't begging. She said, you get that woman and her boy out of here. For the son of this bond woman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. So, of course, the next verse said, Abraham put her in his, her place. I'm the head of the house. Look, that's not what it said. Let me read that. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. His, Ishmael was his son. And God said unto Abraham, Listen up, dude, I'm scared of her too. <laughs> no, he didn't really say that. <laughs> but he said, Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of the, the thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for an Isaac shall thy seed be called. And he goes on to say, don't worry about Hagar and her son, I'm going to take care of them too. And uh, he will also be the father of nations, just like Isaac. And he was, Amish nation. Uh, Amish. <laughs> now, Muslim nations. A little bit of difference between the Amish and the Muslim. But anyway, the point I'm making at, there was a deadlock. Abraham wanted to cling to his firstborn, Ishmael. Sarah, the one who called him Lord in her thoughts. Now it's got her finger in his face. Get rid of that woman and that boy. You know who got Abraham to marry that woman? Sarah. Yeah. She was Sarah's maiden, handmaiden. Sarah decided God promised uh, Abraham a child that I can't do it, I'm barren. So she said, marry my handmaiden and have a child by her. So Abraham, the decisive man of the house, keeps doing what he's told. <coughs> I tell you what, what's the old saying? The man might be the head of the house, but the woman's the neck that turns the head or something. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm not making light of the idea of women being subject here. What I'm saying is, there's no place in reality where it happens 100% of the time. And in sometimes when they're being stubborn, if you'd listen to God like Abraham did, God said, that's do what she says. And I don't think it's because God's afraid of her. I think because Sarah in her anger was on to something. A deadlock came where Sarah wanted one thing and Abraham wanted the other. But even though Sarah was out of sorts, in her anger, she wanted what God wanted for that family to begin to center around Isaac. My point is this. This idea of uh, what Peter had thrown out there, she was subject to Abraham and called him Lord, uh, it's a wonderful thought. And most of the time, I'm sure she did exactly what Abraham told her to do. But the truth is, we're a team. You're married, you're a team. And sometimes, the woman comes up with the better idea. Oh yeah. And you ought to listen. Right? Once in a while, the guy comes up with the better <laughs> idea. Go figure. But, often, it's the other way around. So, even though it's talking about what we talked about Sunday morning, he's hitting it from a different direction, so we didn't get all into everything, and I don't have time that we covered Sunday morning. But it's not an offensive doctrine, because in closing, Jesus told his disciples, they were looking at some Gentiles, some non-Jews, um, who had authority. And Jesus pointed 
at uh, whoever this individual was with authority, he said, you know, in the world of the Gentiles, those who have authority lord it over those beneath them. They push him around with their authority. But he said, it will not work that way in my kingdom. Amen. In my kingdom, if you want to be great, you've got to be the least. If you want to be great, you have to serve. And then Jesus went on to say, use himself as an example, indicating that they already knew who he was. He's the son of Almighty God. And yet, Jesus said, I come not to be served, but to serve. So the one who is subject only to the Father has authority over every other living thing in heaven or earth or under the earth. Have power over everything but, but God the Father. And he came here and said, I'm here to serve you. A good husband has authority over the wife to break a deadlock. But what does authority look like in the kingdom of God? You don't sit on the couch and say, honey, go get me something from the refrigerator. You get your can up yourself. You go in the refrigerator and get something. And while you're in the kitchen, and this is what I titled Sunday's message. While you're in the kitchen, you say, honey, can I get you anything? You say, well, that doesn't sound like authority. That's godly authority. That is godly authority. And it should be inoffensive to anyone. Authority is there when deadlocks need to be broken. Other than that, you're a team. 